Okay, um, welcome to the fourth of our uh, fourth film of our Taiwan uh, Film Week. I'm David Fell. The uh, uh, I help run the Centre of Taiwan Studies here at uh, SOAS. Um, today's uh, event is a little bit different from the uh, the last uh, three days. Today we've got a uh, we're celebrating the, the the paperback publication of documenting Taiwan on film, um, but we're also going to be showing. Um, one of the films that's uh, featured um, in this book. And uh, the book is edited by uh, Sang Zilan and uh, Sylvia Lin. And we're really fortunate that we've got uh, Sang Zilan uh, is going to be here to talk uh, both about uh, her chapter in the book and the process of putting the, uh, the, uh, the book uh, together. Um, I'm the, um, uh, the editor for the Routledge Research on, on Taiwan uh, series, and I was so delighted when I got this this proposal. It's such um, what I liked particularly about this um, this book um, was the the documentaries that they they cover. And increasingly, in, in my teaching, I've been using uh, Taiwanese documentaries um, uh, more and more because I, I feel it's a wonderful uh, resource for us th that uh, for our teaching on Taiwanese politics, Taiwanese society, and uh, Taiwanese uh, history. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have a chapter in the book that looks at the public television service um, uh, documentary uh, Taiwan of People's History. It's, it's, one of, it's an eight-part uh, review of Taiwan's history. And it's something that I often will give to my postgrads or undergrads uh, who um, don't know too much about uh, Taiwan's um, history. It's a wonderful kind of um, straightforward introduction. Um, it also looks at things like social movements. Um, one of my favourite Taiwanese documentaries is Gong Liao Ni Hao Ma, about the um, anti-nuclear movement. And um, uh, uh, Cui Xin, uh, Xin Ling's uh, documentaries is covered in, in another chapter uh, here. Um, one of the problems, of course, with academic publications is they're just too expensive. The, I think the, the hardback version that came out in 2012 was something like 75, 80 pounds. But um, uh, finally, the paperback uh, has come out. So it's an affordable price. And one of the nice things is that uh, because of the floods, uh, Routledge have agreed to uh, sell the, um, uh, the books today at a discount, flood discount price. <laughs> so we will have a few, um, um, uh, a few Routledge paperbacks going for, for 10 pounds wow. uh, tonight. Which is, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to hand over now to. Um, uh, John B. Yu, who's going to talk a little bit, um, and, and then we'll, we'll hear from Sun Tzu Lan. Uh, Professor Sun Tzu Lan, could you wave at everyone? Yes, thank you. Thank you. We are very lucky to have her here. And she is the Professor of Chinese Literature and Cultural Studies at Michigan State University, in addition to uh, Taiwan, Taiwan's documentaries. I mean, her Actually, her research focuses mainly on gender uh, politics, sexuality, early 20th century Chinese popular literature, and recently on Eileen Zhang, that's Zhang Eileen, the most uh, influential modern Chinese novelists. The documentary uh, Viva, uh, Viva Tono, uh, that we are going to screen tonight, is featured in the book and written by uh, Professor Sang. So, um, as usual, before we start the film, on behalf of the Center of Taiwan Studies, we would like to thank the support from the uh, uh, and and the really generous uh, generous donation we have received from the Ministry of Culture and of course from Dr. Samuel Ying. So, without further ado, um, we will have to, um, you should uh, enjoy this film very much. But. Um, after this, uh, let me explain a little bit about this uh, procedure. After the screening, Professor Sun will give us a little bit of uh, introduction about the film and her chapter. But she was saying to me that uh, maybe she'd like to see whether there's some more questions just immediately after the screening. If uh, you have any questions, please raise your hands. Then, you know, we, she can actually carry on from there. If you are very shy, and you don't really want to uh, initiate any discussion first, then she will uh, trigger your uh, uh, curiosities by uh, giving you some talk and also uh, talk a little bit about her uh, uh, chapters. So let's welcome 
Professor Star formally. And uh, uh, please give her a round of applause, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Fell and uh, uh, Bi Yu and uh, there are other t colleagues at the Center for Taiwan Studies for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I think the last time I was in Hong uh, London was more than 10 years ago. It's really nice to be back. Um, uh, I'd like to um, perhaps just give you a little background information about this film and tell you a little bit about why I chose to screen this film. I was not involved in the uh, shooting or production of this film. Uh, I approached this film mainly as a uh, scholar of Chinese culture. So um, let's see if I could just find, okay. So the, the uh, title of my presentation today is uh, Colonial Modernity history and gender. I think these are the three key terms that I would, I would identify in this film. Alright, so this film was actually shot on a 16mm film and um, as you know uh, from your viewing experience, it's focused on Taiwanese language popular songs uh, during the 1920s and 30s. Um, now, the planning and uh, screen de screenplay development, shooting, and post-production actually spanned three years. The idea for the film uh, originated with Silva Feng, Feng Xianxian, who was a senior producer uh, of the documentary Viewpoint series at the Taiwan Public Television Service. She, uh, she's a very good friend of the music collector that you see in the film, Li Quincheng. That's why uh, she had developed this idea. So she uh, invited a female director, uh, Wei, Jian, uh, Wei Si Jian, Jian, oh, Wei Si Jian, yes, Jian Wei Si, <laughs> <laughs> Jian Wei Si to make the documentary, and uh, Jian invited uh, Guo Zhen Di to collaborate with her. So the two of them uh, got together with the music director, uh, music um, expert and collector, Li Quincheng, and the three of them developed a screenplay for the film. A lot of the research is actually <coughs> contributed by the music consultant, Li, Li Quincheng. Okay. Um, now, when the film, uh, when the documentary was finished, it was first aired in two episodes on the public television service. And um, after the initial screening uh, on television, the directors received a lot of feedback from um, you know, cultural critics in Taiwan. So based on that feedback, they actually shot additional footage and re-edited the film into a, uh, a version that's 104 minutes. And that is the version that you just saw. Uh, they entered this version at the Golden Horse Film Festival uh, in Taipei that year, and it actually won Best Documentary uh, in 2003. Now, the, uh, the longer version, the 104-minute version, was also released in the theaters in Taipei, which was very rare for documentary films at that time, mm -hmm. and it actually had uh, relatively high box office receipts, totaling 1.3 million uh, New Taiwan dollars, uh, which translates into around 8,000 tickets. Okay, so um, you know, since then, this film has been shown uh, quite frequently on campuses at film festivals like this, and also in classes uh, that focus on either colonial Taiwan or Taiwanese film or Taiwanese documentary. So it's still attracting thousands of new viewers every year. Uh, by the way, it's also available on DVD. <laughs> so, um, okay, so uh, when the film was first um, screened in Taiwan, you know, the, the television version came out, and then later on the theater release version came out. So what were the main reactions? There were positive reactions and as well as very negative reactions. So the positive reactions, uh, many run like this, this film uncovered a history that was previously 
obscured by <coughs> political ideology during the reign of the um, uh, during the authoritarian reign of the KMT, the Nas Chinese nationalists. Okay, so from the post-war period un up until say the lifting of the martial law, uh, this history uh, during the Japanese colonial period was sort of hushed over. It was not. Um, a subject for people to openly discuss, and, uh, let alone uh, research. Okay, so um, so the the film in a way restored people's buried memories. Uh, the old timers that you see in the film, you know, they have lots of memories about their youth, which uh, you know uh, coincided with the Japanese colonial period. But you know, they probably for many years were not really encouraged to uh, think about that period. But uh, because of the lifting uh, of the martial law, the general uh, political democratization, and also at the move the move toward indigenization that was happening in Taiwan in the late eighties and uh, throughout the nineteen nineties, they began able to talk about that past. Okay, so this film is encouraging that kind of tendency. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, moreover, uh, the people who like this film also believe that this film is revealing Taiwan's multicultural heritage to the younger generations who don't know anything about the colonial period. Okay, so uh, for example, the people who like, really like this film, who endorse this film, include uh, uh, president, uh, former President Li Denghui, uh, and also the film documentary um, critic Chiu uh, Guifen, for example. Now, uh, on the other side, the people who criticize this film uh, they mainly believe, uh, felt that the film perhaps idealized the period that was under Japanese colonial rule. In other words, the film prettified colonialism. And the people who voiced this kind of criticism include, for example, the former uh, director of the Taipei Culture Bureau, uh, Liao Xianhao, and also the documentary film critic, uh, Guo Lixin. Okay, they all have pretty good reasons for mm -hmm. <laughs> holding their views. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, now one thing you probably noticed already is that this film focuses on the period between World War I and World War II, uh, a seeming golden era in Taiwan characterized by vibrant economic and cultural development. Okay, so why? What is the reason for this? Is it nostalgia? Okay, is it nostalgia? Uh, is there anything hidden beneath the nostalgic veneer? That's my question. Now, uh, first of all, I'd like to give you a little context. Um, Post-colonial nostalgia, this is sort of an oxymoron. Usually when we say the word post-colonialism, post-colonial thinking, post-colonial theory, we sort of uh, assume that uh, the, the people who um, develop this kind of colonial, uh, post-colonial attitude would be somewhat critical of the colonial era. However, in Taiwan there is a somewhat peculiar situation where uh, there is actually such a thing as post-colonial nostalgia. Uh, in other words, nostalgia that's experienced for the colonial per period under Japanese rule. Um, now, in my uh, reading or analysis, I think this kind of post-colonial post nostalgia in contemporary Taiwan is often politically motivated. It is actually more than a sentiment. It actually reaches the intensity of an uh, ideology. And the people who feel, feel this kind of nostalgia, uh, some of them at least, uh, in fact attempt to undermine the legitimacy of the nationalist regime through the idealization or retroactive lionization of Japanese colonial rule. And a good example for this would be um, the former president, Li Denghui. Uh, on some several uh, public occasions, he has openly claimed that before a certain age, like he's in his 20s, he was, he was actually Japanese, mm -hmm. etc. And he would pose uh, in certain pictures that were uh, used for uh, supporting some candidates from the um, I, I forgot the English for that, uh, posing uh, in uh, the attire of a Japanese samurai, etc. Et so, uh, so this is one thing I, I wanted to point out. Uh, in other words, nostalgia, when we talk about nostalgia, it's not just a 
look toward the past, it's actually often motivated by the present, right? And what they want to accomplish, uh, looking toward the future. Okay. Um, now, I believe this film, this is my reading, you can feel free to disagree with me and discuss with me about this. Um, I don't believe this film is simply a case of nostalgia. And I think uh, what is more uh, important uh, for this film is that it contains a reinterpretation of colonial modernity. Um, I think the film puts forth uh, several views or arguments about the nature of uh, colonial modernity. The first is uh, the relationship between colonizer and colonized cannot be simply summed up in terms of oppression, submission, or domination and resistance. Okay. Now, uh, rather than examining colonialism in terms of exploitation, entrapment, identity dilemmas, etc., the film focuses on the constructive effects of colonialism. However, this does not mean that the film eulogizes the colonial regime as playing a purely generative, generative role. Rather, I, think, I believe the film brings, it, brings to light the ability of the Taiwanese to negotiate colonial governmentality and create their own culture. And at the film's core is a search for Taiwanese agency and subjectivity agency, uh, the ability to create, to um, you know, to forge ahead in new directions uh, with limited resources, perhaps. Okay, so uh, one prime example of this kind of cultural agency in the film is the uh, songwriter Chen Junyu. Um, his lyrics and poetry are cited uh, in the film. Now, by the way, the page numbers come from this book, my <laughs> essay in this book. So if you're interested, please uh, do take a look at the uh, books that are available. Okay, um, now when we talk about colonial modernity, um, you know, there are many, many things that fall under that rubric. But to just give you an, a few examples, new ideas, uh, a kind of new commodity culture and popular culture. I believe these things, as, as the film argues, do not simply emanate from the imperialist center to the peripheries. Rather, the colonial modern was created or constituted through a kind of multi-directional cultural circulation and interaction. The colonized exercised a considerable degree of agency. Okay? But at the same time, the film also shows that such agency was being circumscribed within the cultural sphere. In other words, the, you know, the extent to which the Taiwanese uh, colonized subjects who exercised their agency was, um, th there is a limit. They could not, for example, uh, have quite as much freedom uh, or liberty within the political realm. Right? Their agency was mainly expressed within this very circumscribed cultural realm. Furthermore, the relative flexible cultural space of the interwar years was later shut, shut down, or at least <coughs> drastically diminished, once the imperialization or Kominka campaign started during the war. And uh, if you watch the film, you know the film ended with the end of the the so-called golden era of Taiwanese language popular film, right? In the in the early forties, right? As the uh, you know as because of the change in policy, it was no longer possible for the uh, record companies to issue records in the Taiwanese uh, language, right? The songs uh, had to be sung in Japanese, etc. So that marked the end of this cultural space. Okay, um, now another uh, salient theme in this film for me is the figure of the modern girl, okay? Um, there are two uh, major examples in this film. There's the singer Chen Chun, as well as uh, the other younger singer, Ai Ai, who's still alive today. Now Chen Chun, uh, interestingly, is a modern girl from the lower class or lower middle class background. Unlike most Taiwanese new women of that era who were from more affluent backgrounds and were highly educated. So Chen Chen, uh, the singer in this film, she sort of represents an alternative type of modern girl that was made possible through uh, you know, colonial capitalism. 
in other words, colonial capitalism creates certain class mobility during this era. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, the film also shows the limits of this kind of class mobility. Uh, the film turns Chen Chen's love story into a love triangle. So this is a little uh, criticism I have of this film, the way it constructs the narrative around Chen Chen's love affair. Um, you can feel free to disagree with me, but in any case, I, I feel that the film has turned that, uh, that this, this very interesting uh, rich figure of the modern girl uh, and, um, taken it and sort of simplified it to some extent uh, in that it turns the, the, this person's story into a love triangle with some symbolic or allegorical overtones. And this has the unfortunate effect of eclipsing her uh, entrepreneurial spirit and professional achievements mm. as a singer. Mm. Okay, so uh, in the uh, dramatic reenactment that you saw, uh, you see a university president courting, I mean, not university president, <laughs> university student <laughs> dressed in a western suit courting her in the coffee house that she, she, she runs, that right? she opens. And then uh, on the side, there is Chen Junyu, who's always dressed in Chinese clothes, right, eyeing them, right, looking at them as, as if in envy or jealousy. Uh, and then uh, finally, there is a, a Japanese modern boy or modern man that uh, at the end shows up and actually uh, marries uh, Chen Chen. So if you read this uh, plot, it, it's as if uh, saying that a Japanese modern girl is seeking to move up the social ladder through the capitalist economy and marriage. All right. So she wants to uh, overcome her humble class origins by marrying the westernized Taiwanese university uh, student, right? However, he has really conservative parents, so they prohibit that match. So in order to, uh, to show her spite, right, she, to, to overcome that, she marries herself to uh, the Japanese young man who looks uh, very fashionable, very chic, but uh, is actually disease inside. He he carries the germs of tuberculosis. Okay, so she tries to move up the social ladder, but ultimately dies a sacrificial lamb on the altar of colonial hierarchy. Her desire to rise in the colonial hierarchy causes her to overvalue her Japanese suitor's superficial trappings, but not and to uh, sort of ignore his underlying disease, which leads her to illness and premature death. So this is a very interesting narrative, of course, it carries a lot of symbolic meaning. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I mentioned, perhaps the, 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 the use of this story uh, in a symbolic way has the unintended effect of eclipsing the, um, the richness of the real historical figure in, as a, a female entrepreneur and also a very accomplished uh, singer, a very accomplished female professional. Okay. All right, um, just to give you a, a slightly larger context, uh, this film is not alone in terms of its attempt to sort of reconstruct a forgotten history or to rewrite history. Uh, this was actually a larger trend that appeared in the post-martial law era and in Taiwanese documentaries, you know, the, this, is, uh, this has appeared quite commonly. Um, and uh, I would just mention that I think the historical narration or revisionist narration helps to fashion uh, the Taiwanese national identity. You know, in order to create a common sense of identity, narration is extremely important and that's why a lot of filmmakers as well as writers, scholars, they're investing a lot of efforts into the rediscovery or uh, re reconstruction of Taiwanese history. Okay, so that's my short presentation. Uh, I could go on a long time, or I could read you my whole chapter, but I won't do that. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I'll do my best to answer your questions. Uh, however, I need to warn you that I'm actually not an expert on Taiwanese popular music, so there may be things that I don't know, but I will try my best. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, you, you spoke a little bit about the um, 
uh, the kind of academic reaction to the film. Uh -huh. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the kind of general public's reaction in terms of uh, mm -hmm. particularly younger audience members. So, you, do you have any idea how they responded to the, uh, the film? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have looked at some online responses. That's the 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 only source of re response I I have access to. Um, I think, uh, yeah, they there there are still a range. There's still a range of responses. Now, some people are really surprised by this history, uh, and um, and they are glad to discover it. But then there are other people who have this gut reaction against uh, this kind of portrayal of the colonial era as an era that uh, that is worth reminiscing and you know uh, remembering and cherishing even. So I, I would say the public response sort of mirrors the academic, academic response in terms of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I did hear something mumbling at the back. Oh, sorry, Michael. Please. reports that around 1937 there was a quite a cultural split between the younger and older generations. The older generation being pretty negative to the Japanese, mm -hmm. <clears throat> especially those that could remember the, the pre, um, the pre, even the pre-1895. Um, <coughs> but the younger generation, it is said, there was a move that they were hoping for victory over China so that they could then go to the Chinese mainland as Japanese pro-consuls mm. with their Chinese language mm -hmm. and have a rather good career out of it. Mm -hmm. um, the other point I might make is that it was before, well before the Kominka period there were repressive measures. For example, it was the, first of all the Chinese um, newspapers as such were banned, the Chinese language paper. Then they allowed a Chinese language supplement to be added to the Japanese newspapers. Mm -hmm. And then finally that was thrown out. And mm -hmm. this was all quite early on in the 1930s. So mm -hmm. there's plenty of evidence that it wasn't just the Kaminka period. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. I use the Kaminka uh, period uh, sort of as a shorthand. And in fact, as you mentioned, there were all these policies before 1937 that were developing uh, that suppressed the use of Chinese language. And in fact, after 1937, even during the Kominka period, uh, it wasn't as if there was a universal ban on Chinese language either. Uh, in, some, some, in some places, it was still possible to use Chinese language and, uh, for example, uh, in in uh, Taiwanese opera, you know, even though uh, the the opera troops they could no longer perform a, a, a the very traditional form of opera, they actually developed a kind of hybrid opera that you that makes Chinese, I mean, uh, Ch Taiwanese or Chinese language as well as Japanese and um, you know Western music. It's called opeha, obeha. I don't know how to say it. Obe obeha, yeah. So. Um, so when we talk about the Kominka period, it's it sort of functions as a shorthand, but it's very crude. If uh, if you are a serious historian like yourself, then you would actually look at uh, the the development, the complexity of the policies over time. Yes. The other thing mm -hmm. just to mention, if I may, there was the attempt to establish the Shinto religion mm -hmm. and the building of a shrine. Mm -hmm. Building. Uh, I'll repeat that. The attempt to establish a Shinto religion mm -hmm. and the building of shrines, which was pretty much a complete failure. Okay. Uh, showing the resilience of the, of the Taiwanese. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. And in fact, there is a footage in there showing uh, a traditional Chinese temple. And uh, when they showed the, the footage, they actually superimposed one of the uh, essays written by this lyricist, Chinese, uh, Taiwanese lyricist. Chen Jingyu on top of it, and he was talking about how it is important for the lyricists to write for the people. Mm. And it, it was very interesting that they chose the footage showing um, a, a indigenous type of religion or temple to go with, to go along with that essay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
We can take another question. Anyone? Yes, Paul. Thanks. Um, I, I really enjoyed the film, and I just wondered what other bits of uh, or, or uh, examples of popular culture, such as television or radio or um, I don't know, literatures, that uh, were, were were being mediated by this by by, by Japan's colonial modernity, as you call it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, there were lots and lots of things that were being uh, mediated. Um, through Japan. Cons and who mm -hmm. was consuming it? Yeah. Who was consuming it? <laughs> well, um, for example, in, in terms of literature, a lot of Taiwanese writers during the time, they learned about uh, Western literature, uh, including Marxism, through Japanese sources. Um, so Japan was not just a, a uh, oppressive colonizer. It was also, as you said, it, it, it was helping some of the Taiwanese intellectuals to get in touch with some of the most progressive thinking uh, in the world during that time. Okay. So it has this uh, ambiguous role or double role uh, as both uh, oppressor, <laughs> uh, exploiter that extracts a lot of resources, natural resources from Taiwan, and the enlightener. Right? And so a lot of uh, Taiwanese intellectuals during this time uh, felt conflicted about it. Um, uh, and then uh, what was the other, uh, in terms of radio and other mass media, that I do not know quite as well. Um, I'm not sure, yeah, I, I'm not really sure what kind of radio program was available during this era. Mm -hmm. um, surely there was no television right, during this period. Okay. Um, now, uh, in terms of the printed media, um, in terms of newspapers, uh, it was for a while the major newspapers. They, uh, you know, some of them at least, they published a Japanese language edition, also a Chinese language edition. And the more educated um, Taiwanese intellectuals, if they received some kind of China, uh, Japanese language uh, education, they would they could write in either medium. Okay. So, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, thank yeah. you for this uh, wonderful talk and the lovely introduction of the film. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you.